God's word is the light of life. It is powerful. It's the glory and food for our spirit. Open your heart and mind as you receive truth and inspiration of God's word that will change your life forever. As God's servant, Pastor Chooks Etty, the lead pastor of Doxa Life International Church, leads you into a life of limitless possibilities. Before you, you sit, let's read. We'll read from, we read 21 and 22. Jude, just in case you're wondering where Jude is. Jude is in the New Testament. Is that 21? Okay. Now, can we read it together one to go? Keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. 22. And of some have compassion, making a difference. All right. You may be seated. God bless you. You know, we've been looking at this subject, making a difference. making a difference. And we have said several things. We try to define what making a difference is. We've also tried to tell us why we need to make a difference. And we've been trying to look at some characters some of the people that made a difference. Now we, we said that making a difference is to have a significant effect or impact on a person or a situation. Making a difference is to have a significant effect, influence, impact on a person or even a people because it can be more than a person. You can decide to take on a particular class of people and decide to make a difference in their lives. And that we found in the life of David if time permits and if the Lord permits, we're going to be looking at the life of David. And one of the things that have guided us as a church, that scripture, very important. The Bible says concerning David, David was on the run. Running away from Saul. And the Bible says some vagabonds, some people who were discontent, people who didn't know their left from their right, people who didn't have direction in life. They came to meet a man who was on the run, running away from the king. And the Bible made us to understand that those men, about 400 men, they came to meet, David was a much younger person. But you know what happened? David made a significant effect, an impact on the lives of those 400 men, including his own siblings and his parents, that in the process of time, those confused young men, vagabonds, the Bible says they were indebted, they were tired of living, and we were meant to understand after some years that those people became the mighty men of David. Some of them, the Bible would describe them that with a sleigh, they could just with one swing like this take on 30 people. That some of them, we, we go to during snow, attack a lion and kill lion. Some of them slew giants, did several exploits. And what will you call that? That is a man having influence or effect on a life of a person. Somebody who didn't have direction. But by encountering David, they had direction. Their life 
had meaning. Their life became meaningful. So that's what we're talking about, making a difference. Now the question is this, and that should be your desire. When people encounter you, what becomes of their life? When people meet with you, now for some ladies and even for some men, when people meet with you, what they encounter is seduction. You are not making a difference. You are actually adding to the problem. For some young boys, when some people meet you, what you, because when we talk about seduction, seduction has, is not just about the men or the women now. Women are not the only people who seduce. Women can seduce with their dressing and with their movement and men can seduce with their words. Speak, just start rapping, saying nonsense. And foolish and stupid girls will believe them. Just be concocting lies. Telling you your eyes is sparkling like the angel. And you are listening. The question is this, who did this thing to you? So the question is this, when people encounter you, what becomes of their life afterwards? And I know, I know some men, let me, let me start with the ladies. Some ladies have actually caused the day they met some one stupid boy. Because that became the time that their lives derailed. And some, women, some men too, we cause the day they saw one girl and from the day they saw the girl, their lives began to go downwards. But you see, you can decide to be different. That when people encounter you, rather than their lives going downwards, their lives begin to go upward. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? So that's what we're talking about, making a difference. And we said that this making a difference too could also be having an effect on a situation. Maybe there is a trend. There is a particular pattern in, around you or where you live. But you decide and say, look, this thing cannot continue to be like this. I must do something about it. You begin to walk towards changing that particular situation. For example, I can tell you part of our calling as a church is to ensure that the faith and the testimony of not bank is changed. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? That is, that is our calling. That is our pursuit. That is our passion. And we're going to pursue that passion. We're going to pursue that calling until it becomes a reality. And I can tell you it's going to become a reality. In fact, it is already a reality. We see it. I was sharing with them on Wednesday, you know, after the, the Avis outreach that we had, I think that was two Saturdays ago. A Muslim, one of the guys that sells Igbo in that place, a Muslim, you know, I've been, all the time we go there, I try to reach out to him. He said he had a dream and he sent somebody to tell us he didn't come to the church. He had a dream. He has not been here when we've been declaring that we're going to build the church there. He said he had a dream and he saw that our church was built in that avis that God built for himself a church in that place. And I can tell you that it's coming to pass. It's going to come to pass. We will dethrone the devil. Wherever the devil is found, not just in avis. That is our calling. Our calling is like of that of David. And I want you to know that it's the calling of every believer. We realize that making a difference is our calling. is what God has called us in, into. And he said, you are the light of the world. And how many of you know that light makes a whole lot of difference? True of us. You know, if we, if we put, on, put off the light in this place, and we put it on, you will see the difference that it makes. Huh? True or false? In fact, we don't even have enough light in the auditorium. And by the time we put more light, you see, 
the difference becomes clearer and clearer. True or false? So that's what God is telling you that you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And you are a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. God wants you to be a solution provider. God wants you to be one of the people who are changing things. And not one of the people who are just sitting there complaining. And let me tell you this. Nothing works until you work it. Never forget that. Nothing will ever work. Nothing will ever happen until you make it happen. You know, most times we are waiting for God. Even in our personal lives, we, we say we're waiting for God. True of us. How many of you have ever said you are waiting for God? You are waiting for him. And as you are waiting for him, he's waiting for you. <laughs> Can you imagine that God is waiting for you? You say, well, how? You realize, now let me give you an example. How many of you remember the story when the Israelites, when they left Egypt and they got to the Red Sea? And before them was the Red Sea. And behind them, the army of Egypt. And Moses began to cry unto God. They were waiting for God. And what was the question that God asked Moses? No, what was it? He asked him a question first. No, he said, why are you crying unto me? You've not read that in your Bible. He said, why are you crying to me? He said, stretch forth your hand. That means, why are you waiting for me? Why are you disturbing me? You don't know what to do. He said, why are you crying to me? He said, stretch forth your hands and divide it. Now, it's the same thing, you know, oftentimes, I think I've shared this story several times. And I want to give you also, maybe that will help you to understand. I, 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 I said something one time. That one of the things that drove me passion to reach out to court boys when I was in school. That I, 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 as a young boy, growing up, I hadn't gotten admission. I stayed four years before I got admission. And I was hearing the kind of atrocity and the mayhem that, that court boys were doing in school. I, at times I would even hear that they raped a Christian sister. I said, what, what a nonsense. Is it that the sisters don't know who they are or what? I remember one of my cousins came from school, Unilag. I asked her a question. I said, what is happening? What is this court nonsense that I hear about? He said, it's real. And I asked her a question. She happens to be a believer. What are you people doing about it? What are the Christian community doing about it in the school? He said, they are praying about it. And I said, is it only prayers that you people are doing? He said, yes, that those boys are dangerous. So we're just praying. I said, it's only prayer. You people just pray. And do nothing about it. It's not complete. The circle is not complete. You pray and you step out. You pray and you look for them. Now let me tell you this. No matter how you think, how dangerous you think they are, it's not true. They are, they are more fearful than you think about. I'm telling you, I, I've been in this business for a long time. They are more fearful. In fact, one of the reasons why they carry guns is because they are afraid. And you see them all the time looking at their back. And they can't stand somebody who is confident and walks to them because every other person is afraid of them. And you walk to them and say, oh boy, how are you? You have disarmed them. And that can only come by knowing who you are in Christ. You see, greater is he that is in you than all the devils put together in this whole world. Now, the truth is this. Not many Christians know who they are. Not many. I have been called to make a difference. That is my passion. That is, that is my longing. You might have another passion, something that comes to you, but the truth is this. Each and every one of us has been called to make a difference. We have been called to if impact somebody. Now, can, can you, now look at, can you picture this with me? I don't know how many we are. I know the most times were, last Sunday were 170 something. 
and I know here we're more than 100. Okay? Now, think about it. You know, we do we want to change the country? We want, we want the country to be changed. Now, picture this. 100 of us here. We are too many to change things in this land. Too many. Now, let me give you a picture. We are 100. To start with, maybe in one month, each one of us set out to influence just one person. Each and every one of us. How many people will, will, are we going to become? 200. I'm not just talking about bringing people to church. People whose mind has been renewed. People who are walking in the light of the word of God. 200. And when those 100 join the 100 of us, they are asked to do the same. We become 200. And 200 of us go out again to get just one person. What will happen? 400. And when the 400 comes, we are, we are you know, empowered again. And 400 of us go out again to bring one more person. One person. What will happen? 800. You see, you can, you can realize that changing the world, changing our world, is not as hard as we think. Now, but the truth is this. We have too many irresponsible Christians. The truth of the matter is this. We have people, what we think that coming to church is, is that when you get born again, you just come and sit in the church and shout, sing, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And then you are waiting for God to do something for you. No, sir. When you become a Christian, you have been recruited into an army. Hear this again. When you become a Christian, you didn't just become a Christian to come and sit down in the church. You have become, you have been recruited into an army. You have become a soldier. And what is, what is, the, what is the responsibility of you being a soldier? You have been recruited to become an ambassador. You have been recruited to expand the frontiers of the, of the kingdom of God. Because God, the kingdom of this world, this kingdom belongs, this earth belongs to God. But in, 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 in the way things are, it doesn't really because the devil has taken over the systems of the earth. And God wants to reclaim back the system of the world. And God is not going to come down from heaven to do it. God is going to do that through you and I. And I don't know how many of you, that, that, is, that becomes your calling. That becomes your passion. For some weeks, we're looking at the life of Ruth. And today, we're going to be looking at the life of the Samaritan woman. John chapter 4. I'm looking at the time. and John chapter 4. I wish we can have all the time to, to read that scripture. But I want to encourage you, when you go home, take your time and read. John chapter 4 from verse 1. But let me try to tell us the story. I'm beginning to bring out some points from there. Now, it, it, it happens that Jesus was on one of those his missionary journey moving from one city, town, and village to the other. And Jesus was on his way to Galilee from Judea. And the Bible says he needed to pass through Samaria. He's been preaching for a long time. And the Bible says that when he got to the well, the well that Jacob built, he was tired and was hungry. So he sat by the well and sent his disciples to go look for food. And while he was, he was there, tired, waiting for the disciples to bring food, a woman, a Samaritan woman, came. The Bible made us to understand that was around 12 noon. Now, usually... In the, in the Old Testament or those days, 
12 noon is not really the time that people go to go to the well. Are you getting it? Most times, people who go to the well are people who are ostracized, people who are marginalized, people who are ashamed to identify with the crowd. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? So, they find that time. If you have lived in the village setting, you know there are specific times that people go to fetch water. How many of you know that? Okay, everybody's claiming. Okay, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> I know there, there are specific times. Specific times. And you see everybody go because that's when the thing is clean. Because that is where everybody, the drinking water is from there. So, they go. But you see, during those days, people who are ostracized, don't go when every other person is going because it's going to be shameful for them. So they try to go when they won't meet anybody there. So this woman came to fetch water around 12 noon and met Jesus by the well. And Jesus asked him, woman, give me water to drink. And the woman looked at Jesus. First of all, the woman was shocked because in those days, Samaritans and Jews, they were not in talking terms. One, because Jews looked down on the Samaritans, saw them as sinners, people who didn't have any connection to God. So they were not talking with them. They looked at them as inferior people. So he was shocked when he saw Jesus, a Jew, asking him for water. And the woman asked Jesus, you, how dare you, a Jew, ask me to give you water to drink? And Jesus said, look, if you know the person who is talking to you, you will ask him to give you the living water. And the woman looked at Jesus and said, ah. <laughs> he said, look, I have Bogahel. I'm the one, you know, I'm the one, I have my bucket. You, you don't even have a cup. Okay, how do you intend to fetch this water to give me? He thought that the living water was inside the well. <laughs> Jesus said, look, this water that you are coming to drink, when you drink it, you will still come back tomorrow. But the one I'm giving you, it stays in you and springs up as a well of living water. You know what God? He said, you don't need to come back. Now, let me tell you what Jesus was saying. Now, not just that you will have the well in you. You, you know what? When you have a well in you, people come to fetch from you. That's what I'm telling you. When people encounter you, what happens to them? You are, you are a fountain of living water. You are a life-giving spirit when dead men, people who are dead in sin, dead in trespasses, when they come in contact with you and fetch the living water that is on your inside, their life is supposed to come to life. He said, the one I give is not like this one that you fetch. When you fetch it, you will come back. Oh, the woman became more curious. Now, let me tell you this. Now, what do we learn from Jesus when it comes to making a difference. You see, in fact, you see, when the disciples of Jesus came and saw Jesus talking with the woman, they were wondering, it's like, this is our master. <laughs> they became suspicious. What, what has he, is he aware of this woman? Where Jesus talking with the woman, hey, John, John will ask Peter, do you even know what Jesus is saying, telling this woman? They became suspicious. Now, now let me tell you this. You see, when you want to make a difference, you forget about yourself. You see, because there are territories, you, 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 you oh, Jesus is amazing. Jesus, Jesus, with Jesus, even if men rejects you, Jesus doesn't reject anybody. Even if the people look down on you, in the eyes of Jesus, you are valuable. That woman was ostracized. Jesus looked at her and asked her, 
Go and call your husband. Jesus said, go and call your husband. The woman said, no. <laughs> I have no husband. I don't have a husband. Jesus said, you said the truth. You had five husbands. The one you are living with now is not your husband. Now that means, let me announce to some of our people, it doesn't mean, you know, the culture in this place, once a boy and a girl are living together, they say they are husband and wife. So that you are living with somebody doesn't make you the person's wife. He said you are living, actually you are living with a man, but that one is not your husband. But nevertheless, you see, Jesus wasn't even trying to condemn her. One thing about Jesus, he's so amazing, is that Jesus will ask you to come the way you are, but he will never leave you the way he met you. Jesus can pick you from the miry clay and set your feet on a rock to stay. That woman was ostracized, looked down on by the society. You know, one of the things that this woman, this woman kept looking for satisfaction in places and things that can never satisfy. You see, in life, let me say this. There is a space that God has put in every man that only God can fill. Nothing in life can fill that thing. But most times, you see, people try to fill it with things. Fill it with alcohol. Fill it with women. Want to fill it with men. Want to fill it with fashion. Want to fill it with money. And they realize that the more they get those things, the emptier they feel. In fact, at times, that void, that emptiness, people think they can, they can fill it with sexual intercourse. And they realize the more sex they have, the emptier and more useless they feel. Am I communicating to somebody? You just realize that the more you are doing this, the more, the emptier you feel. That was the kind of situation that this woman found herself. And Jesus began to tell her, I said, look, I am what you are looking for. What you are looking for cannot be found in green bottles. What you are looking for cannot be found in money. What you are looking for cannot be found in anything. He said, I'm the living water. When you drink me, you'll be satisfied. Now, let me say this. The differences you make in life could be physical, like paying somebody's school fees, giving somebody something to eat, true of us. Huh? Maybe you see somebody who doesn't have clothes. You give the person clothes. You can even make a difference by setting somebody up in business or in life. True of us. Now, but let me tell you this. That's good. And that's one of the things God encourages us to do. God wants us to do that. And we're going to do that. But let me tell you this. The highest difference you can make in a person's life is not physical, but spiritual. Are we together? Come on, are we together? Of what use will it be that you set somebody up and the person still went to hell? Of what use will it be that you, you build a house for somebody and yet there is no Christ in the person? Now, let me say this. You know, most times we think that what we need are physical things. But what you need, can you tap in? Can you see it up? Thank you. What we need, life is spiritual. I want you to say, can you help me tell your neighbor life is spiritual? <laughs> life is not physical. Life is spiritual. Life is more spiritual than it is physical. And you know, why? one of the reasons why it's spiritual, because one, you are not even a physical being. You are a spirit being. You are a spirit and you have a soul and you live in a body. 
Now let's go back to the story that we're looking that we're looking at. Now you see, in that contest that Jesus needed water, and the woman had the bugal there. Who was the needy person there? Eh? In the physical realm, who was the needy person there? But you see, in reality, Jesus was not the needy person because Jesus actually knew that what he had was more than what that woman had. And Jesus also realized that what I have, this woman needs. You know, some of us at times you think, oh, if I can only have money, my life will change. How many of you have ever thought about, your, you have ever thought like that? Raise up your hand. You say, oh, if I, if I only, that's it, eh, my life will just change. If, if I just, for some persons, their own is just 10,000 naira. <laughs> for some persons, theirs is just, say, if I can just get 20,000 naira, my life will change. For some persons, they say, if I can only get 50,000 naira. You know, that reminds me of a story. Two persons went to pray somewhere. And one man was praying, oh God, 5,000. Shouting, shouting, shouting. Oh God, 5,000. Give me 5,000. And this other man, a business mogul, was looking for something serious from God. And this other one that was looking for 5,000 was shouting and wouldn't allow this man to concentrate. Oh God, 5,000. And the man came and asked, he said, how much are you looking for? Counted it, 5,000. Take, leave this place. You are disturbing my prayers. <laughs> In any way, God answers prayers. <laughs> God is humorous. You know, he can answer prayers in a humorous way. He said, you are disturbing me. I'm asking God for serious something. This is your shouting, 5,000. Take, out. Just leave this place for me. <laughs> so, at different levels. But, now, let me ask you a question. Okay, let me leave money alone. There was a time you thought that all you needed in this life was a smartphone. If I just get this smartphone, my life will change. If I just get this smartphone, I'll be, I'll be the happiest person on earth. How many of you were there before? Raise your hand. I know you are, you say, ah, this phone that is raining now, if I just, I'm not happy. Anytime they see you, you are not happy. Why? You can't even tell people why you are not happy. And you are looking at this toy phone. What am I doing with this toy phone? Lord, hey, the day you give me, I will be the happiest person. And all of a sudden, you had the money, bought the phone. You just discover that your joy evaporated after that day. You are wondering, your heart started looking for something else. True of us. Maybe as you were coming, you saw somebody with one fine phone. Hey, one fine, it might even be a, if another phone. Or it might even be a watch. You say, Kai, if I, if I get this watch, eh? or if I put a flat screen television in my house, everything will change. But you discover that the day you bought that television, your heart started longing for something else. Never satisfied. Never. Because things cannot satisfy you. And you are wondering why. See, let me tell you this. You came from God. You see, when God wanted to make things, God looked at the, the plant he spoke to the ground and the plant came forth. And that is why anytime you uproot the plant from the soil, what happens to the, so the, the, the plant? It withers. God spoke to the waters and the fish came forth. And that is why when you remove the fish from the water, and when it came to you, God making you, see, you didn't come from the sun. God spoke to himself. He said, come, let us make man in our own image. So God, your source is from God. And that is why anytime you are disconnected from God, you are dead. There are two kinds of death. 
Physical death and spiritual death. And let me tell you, spiritual death is worse than physical death. Disconnection from God. And that was what was happening to this woman. And Jesus encountered her. Said, look, I am what you are actually, what you have been looking for. What you have been looking for, you can't find it in men. You can't find it in money. You can't find it in food. You can't find it anywhere in the world. It is, I am the living water. Anyone who drinks me has come to a place of rest. Now, let me ask you, let me tell you this. Oh, Jesus. And the moment that woman encountered Jesus and her life was transformed, you know what happened? She abandoned the water that she came to fetch. She left her bucket. You see, when a man truly encounters Jesus, your search ceases. When a man truly encounters Jesus, your longing for things ceases. When a man truly encounters Jesus, the things of this world begin to lose their meaning and their relevance to you. The moment that woman encountered the living water, her search ceased. In fact, the water she came to fetch, she dropped it. She left it. She couldn't. She said, no, this, I've gotten what I've been looking for all these years. You see, why some of you can be enticed by the word? Because you have not really found Christ. When you truly found, find Christ, nothing else will matter in this world. Nobody can entice you. And you know what the Bible says? Concerning the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God is like a man. Matthew chapter 13 verse 44 to 45. Please if you can get that. He said it's like a man who was searching for treasures. That when that man found that treasure in a field. He went and sold everything. And bought that, that, that field. Matthew 13 44 to 45. Now, he said again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure, hid in a field. There which when a man had found, he hid it. And for joy thereof, oh, wasn't this like the experience the woman had? The joy of encountering Jesus, she threw away her bucket. We're going to see that. For, for joy thereof, go it, sell it all that he had, and buy it the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking a goodly place. Now, is this saying the same thing? You found the kingdom. Let, let me tell you this. If you truly find the kingdom of God and know what the kingdom of God is, there is no price that you can't pay to walk with Jesus. There is no price that you can't pay to walk with Jesus. Some of you, Telemundo cannot even allow you to have a to fellowship with Jesus. Some of us is a premiership. You can't, you can't do it. There was a time I was like that. But when I truly discovered the joy of following Jesus, nothing else compares to it. Personal intimacy with him. Nothing compares with it. Now, trying to look at this, the life of this woman, when she encountered Jesus, she ran into the city. That's where they're making a difference is now. We're, we're getting to that now. She ran into the city and began to announce to, the, to, to her people. He said, come and see. Come and see. Come and see. She couldn't keep it to herself. Now, let me ask you a question. If you find the cure for HIV, what would you do? I want to ask somebody. Okay, you see your problem? You're, you, are, you become a millionaire. See your, you, see, and that's, you see, and that's why when money is seeing you, it's running away. Because everything we're thinking is just money. Uh, 
can somebody tell me when you if you find the cure to HIV, what would you do with it? You will hide it in your village. Eh? In fact, you will, you will want to see the president. Is it not? So that the whole world will know. Let's say truly that you have found the cure for HIV. Or in one of the incurable diseases. You found the cure. Will you put it in your pocket? Let's forget about it. Did somebody say you become a millionaire. That's what they are thinking. You are just thinking in terms of money. In fact, that's one of the things. You see, when you begin to think in terms of money, you can never make a difference. If all you are thinking in this life is money, money, you will never make a difference. Because, you see, when you are thinking like that, even when you help somebody to carry their bag, you are waiting for them. Uncle, I say I'm going. Eh? You want them to give you money because you assisted them. You see, because people don't think about making a difference. You see, young people, especially young, you see, let me, let me address this issue. You see, young people, they see elderly person carrying load. They will greet the person and pass. They, they are seeing somebody, an elderly person carrying bags, two bags and other things. They will greet the person and pass. You see, something is wrong with you. Something is wrong with you. Or you are, you are sitting in a place. You are seeing an elderly person standing and you are seated. You can't beckon on the elderly person to come and take your seat. Something is wrong with you. You see, when you, are, you think in terms of making a difference, you think beyond yourself. And that's the only way we can change this nation. Why is our world the way it is, our nation the way it is? Because people are just thinking about themselves. Somebody will be giving a contract to tar the road. The person will pocket the money. And he doesn't care. One million persons can die on that road. Who can, that, he, he, he's not moved. And it's the same thing. This person who is thinking about, and this person who said, I'll become a millionaire. Let me tell you what you will do. By the time you get that money, get that, and that's why God will not give you the cure for it. By the time you get it, hey, you will make it in such a way. You said, one, if I give you one, one dose, one million dollars. Because that's, that's what you are thinking. You are just thinking about money. You are not thinking about saving lives. But let's assume, which I, except for the Nigerian mind has just been messed up. And I told you you are not a Nigerian. If you are a Christian, you must, your mind, your, your, you must upgrade your mind to think above an average Nigerian. Now, if you found the cure for HIV, will you hide it? Now, can I ask you? Do you know that sin is worse than HIV? <laughs> do you realize that sin is more dangerous than HIV? Do you realize that iniquity is more devastating than HIV? And you found the cure. What are you doing with it? Have you found the cure? Let me ask you. Are there people who have found the cure? You found the cure for your own life first. Two of us. God delivered you. Jesus is the answer. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation. The sin, if you realize that sin is more disfiguring, is more deadly than HIV. In fact, HIV came as a result of sin. HIV even came, some incurable diseases came as a result of iniquity upon iniquity. You see human beings sleeping with horse. See human beings sleeping with dogs. See human beings sleeping with all manner of things. And iniquity is mort Sickness and diseases are multiplying. Coming, just iniquity is just abounding. People are doing several terrible wicked things. And is giving rise to all manner of incurable things. And you have the answer 
The question is this. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? Are you going to be like that woman? When she saw the answer, she ran into the town and like a mad woman, she forgot. And that was woman, one woman that was ostracized. She wasn't mingling with people. But when she found the answer to the problem of their city, when she found the answer to the problem of their nation, she forgot about how wicked people have been to her. She ran into the city and said, come and see the person who has told me all about my life. He said, this man must be the Messiah. He said, come and see. Come and see. I said, you see, one of the things you must do, oh Jesus, the greatest difference that we have to make is changing the man. And it has to be with, you know, it's, thank God we're going to be doing that, but beyond paying school fees for people, until people's spirits are changed, regenerated, you have not done anything for them. You can even heal somebody and raise the person to death. Raise the person from death. And the person still went to hell. What use is that miracle? Of what use? I, I heard a servant of God say something one time. I think that Pastor Chris. They lost one of their elders and he was trying to charge the people. And he said, look. That in his life, has, he's beginning to realize there are some things you just allow. That he can't remember, he can't forget in his life. There was a time a sister died. And he said he prayed for over an hour. And that sister came back to life. Now, the sister came back to life, but you know what happened? In course of time, the sister backslided. And he said he never kept regretting about why did he even pray for this sister to come back to life in the first place. And it's like, I see probably the sister even died in sin. So he said, he said that he re regretted that action almost for a long time. I'm telling you, see, there are things that are more important than gold. There are things that are more important than silver. And that's why I started by saying that, look, oftentimes we are pursuing after mundane things and we don't pay attention to the things that really matters. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a dying man, somebody who was dying on, on a sick bed and say, go and bring me my check? Have you ever seen? Come on, have you seen? He said, please, I have 10 checks. Go and bring them for me. Let me sign my last the, that is the last, the least thing on the mind of somebody who is dying. You see, when you want to die, that's when the reality of life begins to come to you. You just discover how you have wasted your life pursuing things that never matter. You some, that's when some men who were pursuing things and never had a relationship with their family will remember that they just wasted their lives. This woman made a difference by letting other people to know the difference that Jesus has made in her life. You know, some of you, when they, you are asked to preach the gospel, you say, ah, what will I say? This woman just got saved in one minute and in the next second, she became an evangelist. You know, the, the, the problem here is that we are, we are, our own evangelist is tied to. You don't need a title to be an evangelist. He said, do the work of an evangelist. He, he, don't go for title. Go for work. Do the work of an evangelist. As Jesus. Now, the question I want to ask you, for those of you who are born again, if you are truly born again, has Jesus made a difference in your life? Come on. Has Jesus made a difference in your life? And do you think it's something that everybody needs to know or needs to have? Do you think so? Yes. Now the question is this, what are you doing with it? Why are you hoarding it? If you said you will not hurt, you won't be able to hide the cure for HIV. Why are you hiding the cure for something that is more serious than HIV? The greatest difference you can make in this life is to bring the gospel 
to the dying world. You see, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the cure for the violence that we're seeing in North Bank. The gospel is the cure for prostitution that we're seeing in North Bank. The gospel is the cure for what are all the vices? Cultism. The gospel. The gospel. The gospel. Nothing else. You see, you, you can't even, you can't do it by New Year resolution. Now let me tell you this as I end. Do you realize no matter how a he goat, how many of you know the he goat? Is there any perfume in this world that can change the smell of the he goat? Eh? <laughs> now, I think we need to experiment it and get a he goat. Get all the souls and all the perfumes in this world and bait the he goat. Pour the perfume on the he goat. What will happen? The the order will change. The scent will change. Why? You know, there's something, the way they say it in my place. <laughs> okay, that Polokom is, is Nigerian English, okay? You know, Nigeria has its own English. Now, the way they say it in my place is that the thing that is making the heat go to smell is on the inside. It is Polokom. So, the only way, you can't change it by Changing the outside. You know, you see, you see, that is why hijabin is not the cure to loss. You, do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know hijabs. It, it's not the, if, if you like, let all the women in this life be wearing mousy. You know mousy? Now, we're not, that doesn't mean that we're encouraging people to dress anyhow. So that you won't run with it and say, eh, hey, this is what pastor said. Since that is not the cure, now let me buy, you make your suit, your skirt tight. The thing is just showing, just fix on your body like this. And yet, that is not enough for you. You still tear it. The question is this, who did this thing to you? You know there is an attire of a harlot. Do you know that? Come on, do you know that? There is an attire of a harlot. And there is an attire of somebody. You see, I grew up in Aba, the around the park. There is this thing that those area boys do, eh? and it's not, they don't do it to all the girls. There are times you see people, you just see some people dress anyhow. They are the ones that say, hey, hey, shh, shh, shh. and you see area boys wanting to just touch you or talk to you anyhow. And what is making them to do that? Come on, you see. Later, our bishop said something. He said, you are addressed the way you are dressed. Did you hear that? You are what? You are addressed the way you are what? If you want people to address you with dignity, dress, dress with what? Don't, don't do, you say it's, it's what is raining. Your breath, everything is coming out. What did they call those things? What's the general name for them? No, it's not fashion. Private part. Private. It's not public. We do, what are we seeing your breasts for? What, what, of, what, of what use is your breast to us? You know, there's this other dangerous fashion now. You see the back here. This is where people's... This is where the... the no, it's not just the whole back will be open. So, who who is doing this thing to you? Do you, do you know who you are? And people will tell you, "Oh, you are sexy." You say, "Oh, thank you." Something is wrong with you. you. Do you know what it means that that they're saying you are sexy? That they are telling you the only thing you are good for is sex. That when they look look at you, the only thing that comes to their mind is sex. Is what is that? Is that is that something to be proud of? You snap and, and do like this. <laughs> they say slave queen. You are stupid. It's only that you are not aware. <laughs> you say slave queen. 
slay, slay mama. Who? Hey, where did you put your head? You you slap snap your backside. Show us slay. So you see, okay, that that is your the purpose, the summary of your life. Is that all that you can offer your generation? Is, is, is that all you can offer your generation? Can we become like this Samaritan woman? That, that round with this thing that can change the whole world. You know, you know, amazing thing happened when she ran and called all the Samaritans. They came and met Jesus. They said, Jesus, stay here. They didn't allow Jesus to go again. And you know what happened? When they encountered Jesus, they said, woman, <laughs> we, did, we are not just believing because of what you told us. Now that we have encountered him. <laughs> oh, nobody truly encounters Jesus and remains the same. You know, the problem is that many people are doing church. They didn't encounter Jesus. When you really encounter Jesus, your search will change. Your, your search will stop. You become satisfied. You know, it's like you have arrived. You have, you have come home. No wonder the Bible says if any man is in Christ. You know, finding Jesus, it's not even up to that, but let me just give you a tip. Have you ever been, been tested before? And they gave you a chilled water. Not, not the one that is over chilled. Moderate Temperature like that, and you drink it. <sighs> you have come home. Oh, that's what Jesus does. That when a man comes to him, your search ends. But you see, you are not supposed to keep this to yourself. If you want to make a difference, ensure that everybody that you meet finds the same Jesus. Can you bow down your heads? Let's pray. The Samaritan woman made a difference. We said you can make a difference. It has nothing to do with your gender. She was a woman. It has nothing to do with, your, with her past. Her past was nothing to write home about. Her past was so ugly that she has become a dumping ground for men. But yet, the moment she found Jesus, her life became transformed. And the woman instantly became a light and a difference maker. What are you doing with the gospel? What are you doing with the, this, this cure for something that is more deadly than death itself? Do you know that sin is more deadly than death? Death is not the worst thing. Sin is. Sin. Sin turns people's life upside down. Sin twists people's mentality and their mindset. And you have the cure and you are just sitting down with it in church. You have the cure and you are just comfortable. Just be, you are just only comfortable announcing that I'm a Christian. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? You have so many people on your street. Young people on your street. What are you doing with this gospel? Come and see somebody who changed me. Look at, look at, the, look at who I was and look at what Jesus has made me. I was without, without hope. No peace. But when I found Jesus, that can be your own preaching. God has not called you to go to seminary before you start preaching the gospel. God has not asked you to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation before you start telling people about Christ. And at this point, this man had not even read anything. Did she encounter Jesus? She just said, come and see. The man that brought peace into my life. The man that brought direction. The man that changed my thinking. What are you doing with the gospel? What are you doing with the life that you have received? It is, it is, it is your opportunity to make a difference. You can make a difference with the gospel. This Samaritan woman made a difference with the gospel that she received. With her unchanged lives. All of a sudden, that woman that was moody. All of a sudden... That woman that was moody ran into the city excited and announced, come and see everybody. And they were alarmed. 
What has happened to this woman? He said, I met a man today. Huh? He said, is it, is it a new thing? You've been meeting men all this while. He said, no, this one is different. This man is different. This man is not like any other man. This man is not the one that wants to use you and dump you. This one is not the one who is looking for something from you. This man is the one who wants to make you to become like him. Come and see. Come and see. Are you making a difference with the gospel in school? Are you making a difference with the gospel in your workplace? The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Are you ashamed? Are you ashamed? Can you be ashamed of this, this gospel? Can you be ashamed of this solution that the world is looking for? You can't be ashamed of Jesus. Somebody pray. I'm going to be making an altar call now. But this altar call is going to be different. It's not like the altar call for people who want to give their life to Christ. I'm going to be making an altar call for people who said, Pastor, I have not been shining with this gospel. I have not been acting like this woman. I have this cure and I have sat with it for years. From today, I want to make a commitment to reach out, to shine this light to my world. I want to make a difference. I want to, I'm, I'm changing from today. I will act like this woman. I will be mad. I will be, I will be rugged. I will be brutal. Until people see that your own gospel is too much. You have not started. Do you have people like that? You want me to pray for you? You want, you want me to pray for you? You, are, you have been quiet enough. Your Christianity has been so normal. So usual. So casual. So psychedelic. You have been practicing psychedelic Christianity. Ajibo Christianity. You want to do it ruggedly like this woman. You can't hide this. Because no man truly has a light and hides it under a bushel. If your hand is raised, can you rise up on your feet with me? I'd like to pray with you. You want to make a difference with this gospel from today. <laughs> Close your eyes wherever you are. I can't hide this thing anymore. You don't even need to be waiting only, only when it is time for Friday. What are you doing with the gospel? Lift up your hands wherever you are. See, if you're, if you're standing, you don't need to be looking up and down. That, that shows you're not, you're not serious. You should be talking to God by yourself. Preaching the gospel is not just for pastors. Preaching the gospel is not just for evangelists. It is our calling. And the gospel is one of the tools that you can use to make a difference. Nothing else. Grammar will not, it will not really make a difference. You can pay for somebody's school fees and send a person to school. It's good. But you end up release, unleashing more more. more more harm than good to the society. But when the gospel, when a person encounters the gospel, oh, you have released a light. Lift up your hands wherever you are. I want to pray for you. Like Jeremiah said, he said, even when I made up my mind not to preach, he said, your word were like fire shut up in my bones. <laughs> Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters. Lord, I ask that uh, that same spirit that came upon the Samaritan woman, that she couldn't keep it to herself. She couldn't keep this treasure to herself. The Bible says we have this treasure in 18 vessel. We carry this treasure she ran to the city. It was an, a matter of urgency. It was an urgent thing. She ran to the city. Lord, I begin to pray. Let the, let the spread of the gospel become urgent in our spirit. 
let it become urgent in our spirit, in our spirit, in our spirit, in our spirit. Let it burn like fire. Let it burn like fire. Today, from today, we won't be able to keep our mouth shut. The unction to preach the gospel is released upon you. The unction to make a difference is released upon you. From today, boldness. 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 Audacity. Fearlessness. Brutality. If they, if they are bold in committing iniquity, we, we can't be timid preaching the gospel. The, if they are bold committing iniquity, committing atrocity, we cannot be timid. We will be bolder than them spreading the gospel. Rascality and brutality of the Holy Ghost comes upon every one of us in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Multitude will come to the knowledge of the gospel through us. Makadi will be changed through us. That woman emptied her city. <laughs> oh God, one woman took a city. We are more than two here. We are more than ten here. We are taking Makadi. We are taking Makadi in the name of Jesus. Fresh fire. This message was brought to you by Doxa Life Media. To enjoy more of the glory life, which is the God kind of life, join us at Doxa Life International Church, House of Mercy Auditorium, Uniagri Road, North Bank, Makadi, Benue State, on Wednesdays by 5 p.m. and on Sundays by 8 a.m. For more inquiries, you can reach us with the following numbers 081 180 433 or 081 487 92013 or send a mail to us at Church at gmail.com. Visit our Facebook page, Doxa Life International Church. God bless you.